I think I'm on. All right. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, so this is a session co-hosted with uh, Society of Economic Dynamics. And the idea of the session is to uh, put together the uh, papers which are interested in the interaction of macroeconomics and financial markets, and essentially how macro policies can um, affect tricks premium in financial markets, term structure, and so on. And I think we have a list of four very exciting papers. I'm looking forward to seeing them. The first one is Anmol Bandari, and he'll talk about the management of the maturity structure of that. It's all yours. Oh, and the rules are we have uh, 25 minutes each for the presentation. All the questions will be answered in the last 20 minutes for every paper, but please write your questions in the Q&A. And if there are clarifying questions, I can lead them out as we go. Go ahead, Anmol. Thanks, Oleg, uh, and sorry for the last minute change in the, in the paper. So the title of the project is Sufficient Statistic Approach to Maturity Management of Public Debt. And, uh, and we want to study the optimal maturity. Basically, what we want to do is study the optimal maturity problem for a government. The, the, what we mean by a sufficient, sufficient statistic approach is, uh, is in an approach where we impose very few restrictions on risk preferences and, and the market structure in which private and, and the private sector and the government participates. And importantly, we derive formulas for the optimal portfolio and how and rules for how it should be uh, should be rebalanced in in this large class of um, of models. The main advantages of our approach is that uh, all the formulas are in terms of objects that are easy to interpret and take to data. Given that they are easy to interpret, they actually uncover several general principles for maturity management, which hold across a large set of uh, set of economies. And they also resolve some puzzling results from existing Ramsey literature. The main finding, uh, the main finding is that uh, the optimal portfolio is well approximated by, um, by exponentially declining weights in maturities, uh, plus minus some deviations from this description. Okay, so the structure of the talk is uh, I'll try to, uh, I'll first lay out, uh, lay out the theory and work through several special cases where all these insights uh, about why we get what we get. And then I'll do a quantitative application with the, with the US data, okay? All right. So let me start with the environment and I'll introduce features which are, uh, which are, uh, which are critical and a lot of stuff will be unmodeled in the sense that it's general to those, those features. The, the, two important, um, the two important agents in our model are the households and the government. And the households are modeled as a continuum of identical domestic uh, agents who can consume, work, and trade in a bunch of securities. Their preferences are given by this recursion where uh, VT is the, value of, uh, is the value at some history time T, and it's, it consists from some contribution of, of utility in time T, and a continuation value VT plus one uh, that operates through this functional WT. Okay, so what we what we do is we kind of impose pretty weak restrictions on U, V, and the functional WT, so that we can include a bunch of uh, models, which obviously include the standard expected utility, where the WT is just an expectation operator, but they also include several models of non-expected utility. Uh, depending on what uh, what we what restrictions we impose on WT, so in the paper the theory requires WT to be uh, just monotone in first and second order, and that basically gives us this bunch of preferences, which include recursive utility of Krebs Porteous, Epstein Zane, you know, and a bunch of other uh, first uh, bunch of other non-expected utility preferences. Okay. The key restriction here, uh, which, I've which I've imposed is that I've taken away income effects, uh, the way we have modeled it. Uh, this is not essential, but it's going to help a lot. But other than that, uh, it captures a variety of ways in which agents uh, can price risk, including shocks to marginal utility, which can, which can, which can, uh, which can, can be exogenous. The next important agent is the government. The government here is benevolent in the sense that it cares about the welfare of the representative agent. It has commitment and it raises taxes using, uh, using distortionary taxes, which are denoted by tau. Uh, 
and it can trade it can also trade in a in a in a subset of securities so the government budget constraint here shows how the flows for the government work oh, b here is the savings of the government so it's negative of that in any period the government comes up comes in with uh, the returns on its past portfolio where rit is just the holding period returns from t minus 1 to t you have the tax revenues and these funds are either spent on some exogenous spending g or they are invested uh, in the next period which is bit what we'll be interested is uh, are in uh, in portfolios which are which are denoted by omega and omega it is just uh, the share of bit in the sum of bit and these portfolios just to, just to make sure uh, um, i don't i don't uh, confuse you these portfolios are all measured in the market value of them so b is the market value of security pi is the market value of security okay now let me talk a little bit about the market structure as i mentioned in the introduction we want to keep the market structure pretty general and and essentially we have securities uh, which can be finite or or infinitely many and they are each described by a stochastic cash flow there are a couple of restrictions we do uh, impose one restriction is that the set of securities that the government trades is a subset of the set that the private sector set, trades in and the other restriction which we impose is that the zero coupon there is a in the in the set of securities which the government can trade there is a zero coupon risk free one period risk free bond and uh, we denote it by security i equal to zero all right so from now on security zero will be uh, will be this um, will be the risk free bond moreover we don't restrict that the trades between the government and the agents have to add up to zero which means the agents can trade with outsiders and and in particular these outsiders can be we can include a variety of forms in which in which these outsiders trade with the private sector including uh, models of segmented markets like couple of which i think we're going to see today okay uh, they 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 also include standard uh, market structures like aro securities or lucas trees and bonds of of different maturities so everything is included here so given that uh, this will be a short talk let me first sketch out what we uh, how we do the analysis uh, and i'll spend most of the time on 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 results from special cases so the broad the broad uh, steps are the following what we do is we consider welfare effects of a perturbation to the government policy the kind of perturbations we are interested in are a perturbations which reshuffle the government's date at some history and then the government rolls over uh, whatever excess returns it, it it gets from this from this reshuffling of debt or time okay so in particular uh, think of the following simple perturbation where it increases the period in some period it increases the holdings of security j and it decreases the holdings of the risk free bond so that the market value of day, of uh, of the portfolio at date t is unchanged now when you do this swap or when the government contemplates the swap it's going to generate excess returns tomorrow and uh, and these returns uh, are rolled over for k periods using the one period discount bond what this perturbation is going to do is it's going to change uh, it's going to need for the government would need to uh, balance its uh, balance its uh, budget constraint and taxes are adjusted in the background so that the government budget constraint is satisfied at all times so in this sense this is a feasible perturbation so then what do we do with this what we do is we think we 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 see the effect of this perturbation both on the social uh, and the private uh, welfare if I, if indeed the the government policy is optimal this perturbation should not generate any welfare gains or losses for the government so that gives you some restrictions moreover since the set of uh, securities which are traded by the governments is smaller than the set of securities traded by the private sector this perturbation should also be privately feasible and and hence it should not be profitable so these two uh, these two uh, these two first order conditions or first order optimality restrictions tell us that uh, or impose restrict impose conditions on on uh, on the welfare effects of this perturbation and what we do is we take tail of expansions of this to derive the optimal portfolio 
The advantage of doing this, uh, the way we do it, is that this approach works quite generally and it gives optimal portfolios uh, in, in a pretty clean way. Okay. Now, let me, uh, let me just sketch out the roadmap for the rest of the talk. Um, if you, if you think about the welfare effects of this perturbation, by the envelope theorem, the effects are going to come either because the, the government has to change taxes or, uh, or because this perturbation changes asset prices. The reason it has to change taxes is because there are, there are, uh, there are in principle, two reasons it can change tax. It, it needs to change taxes. It has to balance the budget in the background and this perturbation can directly change the revenues which the government earns which it, it has to give it back using distortionary taxes. Another reason it has to change taxes is because if asset prices change because of the, due to this perturbation, this money somehow has to be again, again um, adjusted. So the way uh, this naturally, the, the fact that these effects occur through, through direct and indirect effects, uh, it motivates a two-step analysis. And that's what I'm going, that's what, um, I'm going to do. So, the, for, in the first step, we study the portfolio problem, assuming that, uh, or assuming that the perturbation has no effects on prices. This is a very useful benchmark. It's, uh, it's similar, it, it is formally similar to uh, um, a small open economy, or, uh, or you can think of a perfectly elastic demand for, uh, for the government securities. And uh, it's going to give us a bunch of insights which help us uh, understand the main results. And after that, I'll allow I'll, I'll show that uh, we can model price impact in several ways, and that doesn't change the main insights. For the for the talk, uh, I'll discuss a special case where the economy is stationary in the sense that there are no trends. Uh, but in the paper, we do more general versions where you we can allow for trends or or other time varying stuff. Okay, so. I'll need three objects to describe uh, the, the main formula. The first object is the excess uh, holding period returns, one period holding period returns on any security, J greater than or equal to one. Okay. This holding period return is just the return, uh, buying the security J in period uh, T, selling it in, in T plus one, and, and uh, the, excess one, the excess return is that relative to the risk-free rate from, uh, from T to T plus one. I'll denote uh, these excess returns by little rj. The second object I need is a discounting process, uh, but based on the market interest rates. So the idea is that uh, think of a portfolio strategy that rolls over uh, a dollar for K periods. And, and suppose I want to value this, uh, what, is the, what is the price of this, of this portfolio? So that's denoted by QTT plus K. And it is just the product of the interest rates, which, uh, which products of the inverse of the interest rate from, uh, from T to T plus K. And, uh, and, and this, will be, this, will be, this will be interest rates at which you will roll over the uh, rollover for, for K periods. Okay. The last component of the last object I need is, the, is what we call the orthogonal component of primary deficits. So what I mean by the orthogonal component is, is roughly speaking movements in, in primary deficits which are orthogonal to taxes, okay? So, you know, primary deficits equals spending minus revenue and by the orthogonal component, what we want is uh, spending minus revenues if taxes were constant. In the quantitative part, I'll, uh, I'll show you how we, we actually implement it, but conceptually it is just this counterfactual deficits uh, where uh, in a world where, cons where taxes were constant, okay? So now we have these three objects uh, and to describe the formula, I need three covariances. These covariances are indexed by subscript T, which are, so these are conditional covariances. And the three covariances are the covariances of returns with each other. Which, I, which is denoted by sigma subscript T. And an element JK of that matrix would be just the covariance at date T of returns um, on security J and security K, T plus one. So it's a one period ahead uh, covariance of excess returns. 
The second object is uh, the returns with interest rates. So the, the, that um, the, the interest rates which we care about are all are future interest rate, but they are captured from this Q, which I defined before. So a particular element uh, JK would be how returns on security J are, um, are correlated with, uh, with interest rates from, from T plus one to T plus K, K plus one. The last element is the covariance of returns with the orthogonal component of deficits and denoted by sigma x. So once I have, once I have these three uh, covariances, um, another thing I need is, the, is, uh, is a vector q, which is just a set of exponentially declining weights, beta. Okay, so beta, you can think of beta as the inverse of the average return or the discount factor of the, uh, of the of the household. So, what, so the first result here is an expression for the optimal portfolio omega t, and uh, and it's given by uh, by uh, by two terms here here, which are multiplied by uh, by this vector of exponentially declining weights. Okay, so. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about each of this term and try to convey some insights which we can get at this uh, directly at this stage. And remember, this uh, this portfolio holds without you know for any arbitrary market structure. The first thing you'll notice that this portfolio does not have any excess returns in them. So unlike a typical Samuelson Merton type portfolio where you would have excess returns relative to risk, the portfolio here is just in terms of uh, a covariance or uh, uh, ratios of covariances. So the reason why you don't see excess returns here is because the benevolent, uh, because of because the government is benevolent and and excess returns are compensations for risk. Both the private sector and the government value the risks in the same way. So there is no motive here for the government to chase uh, chase excess returns from uh, with respect to the guy it cares about. Okay, so that's the first insight. So what's, the, the, what the government really cares about here is hedging. There are shocks to, uh, there are shocks which affect uh, the budget constraint of the government and, and there are deadweight costs of taxes. So in the background, the government is trying to smooth, uh, smooth these fluctuations. And there are two sources of why the government, what the government needs to hedge here. One is, uh, is interest rate risk. That is interest rates can move and if the government has debts, in particular long-term debts, the valuations of this debt could be sensitive to, to movements in the interest rates. And that, because that would need changing taxes, you need to hedge them. The other thing the government needs to hedge is just directly uh, the, the shocks at the primary surface, such as you know there might be shocks to G, and for that it needs to raise or subsidize revenues. These two hedging motives are captured by, uh, by the first and the second term in the, in the expression. So let me start with the first term, which is uh, how the government or what, what determines the, uh, the hedging of interest rate risk. As you can expect, the interest rate risk is given by a covariance over variance formula, but the covariance in the, in the numerator is the covariance of returns with respect to current and future interest rates. Another, another result which we see directly from, from this expression is that the size of this uh, interest rate risk is, uh, or the relative importance of it depends on the level of the debt. And that's kind of easy to understand. If there was no debt which the government had to roll over, it doesn't need to care about interest rate risk. So as debt goes to zero, this the second term becomes more significant uh, while, while debt uh, well, when the debt is large, the first term becomes relatively more significant. The second term here is the is the conventional primary surplus risk, and uh, that's captured by the ratio of covariances of returns and the orthogonal component of deficits relative to the variance of it. So the logic is similar, except now the uh, now the covariances which we are concerned with are covariances of returns with the orthogonal component. And the reason we care why the orthogonal component shows up in the expression is because in the back of the in the background the government is smoothing taxes. So what it cares about is only movements in uh, in, in deficits 
uh, which are orthogonal to the movements in taxes. Both these terms are multiplied by uh, by this vector q, which is the which is just um, a vector of declining weights. This formula also tells us something about rebalancing. So the time t dependence in this formula comes from the covariances and and from the level of the debt. So as long as the um, the reason to rebalance would be uh, would be that either the that to GDP ratios are changing through history or these covariances are, uh, are changing over time. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, this formula works quite generally with, uh, with, with any market structure, but a particular market structure is, uh, which is, uh, is uh, one where the government can invest in zero coupon bonds of all maturities. And this is instructive for several reasons. It's studied widely in the literature and also this a version of this is what we'll take to data. One thing which happens when you impose this market structure is that, uh, is that the covariance of returns with future interest rates and the covariance of returns with each other is basically the same object. So this, the, this, um, uh, the, this, uh, this term, sigma inverse times sigma Q is one, and then the, the formula even simplifies. It basically tells us uh, two things. One, it tells us that as far as interest rate risk is concerned, concerned, you just want a simple portfolio which has weights exponentially declining in maturity. And there is a nice uh, intuition for why that, that's, that's the case. So a portfolio which does that, essentially in the stationary world will, will replicate a console. And a console is a security which would pay a unit of uh, consumption or unit of output uh, per period. And this is a great security. If, if there was no other risk, if, if interest rate risk was the only concern for the government, a console is great because once you issue the console, you're done. You have a smooth smooth uh, path of, uh, of, of, of debt payments or debt service. And then this is this, and you can smooth taxes perfectly. Now, uh, you, know, you know, of course, in, in a, when you have growth and, and other kind of things, this console needs to be, uh, needs to be changed a bit, but, uh, but, but, but the console gives, uh, gives you uh, perfect hedging for interest rate risk. So no matter what shocks are driving the interest rate, you, you are good to go if you have a console. Uh, more generally, you want to match maturities, but, um, but, uh, um, otherwise, it just, uh, you know, the console is good. The second thing which this expression tells us is uh, you can do a back of the envelope calculation to figure out how important is this, is this exponentially declining console replicating portfolio relative to the second piece here, which comes from hedging uh, primary surplus risk. So I'm going to do a more formal analysis using data from, from US later on. But I think this, at this point, it might be just, uh, it might be useful to give like some back of the envelope numbers uh, and, and, and we can do that quite easily. So what we find from the empirical exercise is that returns are, are quite volatile and a lot of fluctuations in the returns is uncorrelated with the deficits. So if you compute these, this ratio where we take just mechanically take deficits relative to GDP and returns and divided by the covariance of returns, that number is like 1%. So what does- well, You have about two, three minutes left. Take three minutes, please. Okay, so um, given that uh, the, 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 those ratio, that number is small, it, it basically implies that, uh, you know, when you compare it to, uh, to one minus beta over beta, which is a number like 1% to 2%, it gives us that the hedging portfolio should be small. Uh, since I'm running out of time, let me talk about the, 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 the second part of the analysis where we introduce price impact. And to discuss price impacts, I'll need two matrices, uh, sorry, two uh, new objects. One is uh, a matrix lambda, which is a semi-elasticity of price of security J when the supply of security I changes. And a second is just uh, a reformulation of, of the portfolio which we come in with. It's like yesterday's portfolio, but revalued as today's prices. So this, what the structure of the Lambda depends on how we introduce uh, 
how we introduce the inelastic demand for that. And you know, you can think of several ways. You could have a simple demand function for debt where debt is linear, where the price of the debt is just linear in the in the quantity of the debt. And in that in that case, lambda will have a diagonal structure. Our preferred version is the Greenwood Vinos uh, setting, where which delivers a, that the price, the log price of the debt, is a fine in duration. In that case, if lambda won't be a diagonal, it will be a filled out matrix. But you know we can compute all the objects we need. The second uh, object, uh, which is the W adjusted, is just as I mentioned, it's just yesterday's portfolio at today's prices. And with zero coupon bond, we can we can just uh, it's just like you know the three period security would become the two period uh, security adjusted by the price. So what happens when we allow for price impact? We essentially add one more term to the formula, which is given uh, in the red, and. The, all the all the price impact are summarized by this lambda uh, are recorded here. With a little algebra, we can write the previous equation as uh, as uh, as in the bottom, where W star is the portfolio without the price impact. And this already gives us uh, an insight that the price impact mainly matters for the speed of transition. The price, how much does the price impact affect the 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 end resulting portfolio? Can also be sort of guessed. We already know from previous uh, previous slides is that the hedging term is small, but just take a limit and set the hedging term to zero, and then we can show that in absence of the hedging term, the formula with and the with and without the price effects is the same, and it's just the exponentially declining uh, weights. We know that the hedging term is small, so in this sense, the price allowing for price uh, impact or price effects mainly matters for the speed of transition, not much for the shape of the portfolio. Okay, so I'll need to, uh, I'll need to rush a little bit here, but uh, the quantitative application is, is going to the US measuring all these uh, objects, the deficit, the orthogonal component of deficits. For the returns, we, we kind of impose a factor structure and measure the time varying covariances using GARS. And for Lambda, we use estimates from Greenwood Vinus, who in turn use uh, uh, QE, QE stuff in US and UK to get, get land. What we get is the following. Um, let me focus on the, on the red line, which is the optimal portfolio. And the gap between the red and the black line is the contribution which comes from primary surplus risk. So the black line is the portfolio which hedges, is that exponentially declining portfolio which hedges the, role, which hedges the interest rate risk. So the area under the red curve is, uh, is about 85% which means that our optimal portfolio says that you should invest, you should deploy debt 15% in the risk-free debt and 85% according to this shape. If you translate that to Macaulay duration, uh, the optimal Macaulay duration is, is on the order of 10 years and people have estimated in the US to be on the order of five years. So our, our model would say that the, the US debt should be, uh, the US should invest more in, in long-term debts, okay? And Paul, you're, run, you're actually out of time. So do you want to take a, a minute to conclude? Yeah, so this is the last slide. Uh, I just wanted to mention that these results are pretty uh, in contrast to what uh, people have found in the, in the Ramsar literature. And the main reason is that standard RBC calibrations have counterfactual implications for the, the covariance of deficits to returns relative to the covariance of returns. Uh, in particular, that ratio is quite volatile and uh, and large as compared to what we find in the data. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anmol. And um, now we have Jeremy Stein and he will talk about the uh, term structure of interest rates and uh, exchange rate risk. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Good. Um, okay. Well, thanks, Oleg. Thanks very much for including uh, for including me. Uh, so this is a joint project with Robin Greenwood, Sam Hansen, and Adi Sundaram. Um, I should also say uh, the, the 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 work I'm going to describe here is very close to what you're going to hear about. I guess the next in the next little bit from Pierre Olivier. Um, you'll see that the core ideas in our two papers are essentially the same. Um, uh, as it turns out, I think we've taken them in somewhat different directions, and I'll do my best to try to emphasize the stuff that, that, that we do 
differently. And uh, the hope is that this work is, is, is broadly complement. Um, so, so let me just try to motivate the, 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 the basic idea by, by posing the following question. Suppose you have two countries, call them the US and Europe. Let's just stipulate that the path of short rates, the path of essentially central bank policy rates is fixed in the two countries. So that's not changing. The only thing that happens is that Europe, the ECB, does more quantitative easing, okay? So the ECB does quantitative easing that pushes down long-term rates in Europe by assumption that's not because of the expectations hypothesis because I've held fixed the path of short rates. So it's a decrease in the term premium in Europe, okay? And the basic question that we want to ask here is what does that do to the dollar euro exchange rate? Okay. Now, if you're a believer in sort of an uncovered interest parity theory, you'd have to say nothing because again, just by assumption, I fixed the path of the short rates, which is what should determine exchange rates in a pure UIP world. Okay. If you have some intuition that, well, somehow long rates in Europe have gone down, so it must be that the euro weakens, that's what we're going to be about. And I just want to sort of emphasize that that's now a risk premium story. You're basically saying the risk premium, the term premium on, on European debt has gone down. And if you think that the euro is depreciating and it's a violation of UIP, that must be telling you something about the expected returns on the dollar versus the euro going forward. Okay. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell an integrated story of risk premia on long-term bonds, on term premia, and on current, what you might call currency risk premium. Okay, so that's the approach. And what we share with, with Pierre Olivier and co-authors is we're gonna try to do this essentially in the minimal model in which you can get things like QE working. That is where you can get term premium variation that have to do with supply and demand stuff. So in a single country, that would be the kind of model uh, that Dimitri Bayanos and Jean-Luc Vila developed. And we're basically gonna take that, that one country Vianos Vila model and just now have two parallel countries. Again, you can think of it as the US and Europe. And when there are two countries, you're now trying to pin down three objects, the term premium in the US, the term premium in Europe and the exchange rate. And all of these will have risk premia in our model. And it's all about how the joint pricing of these risk premia gets determined. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the core, the core thing that we're trying to do. Okay, and so I basically, that, that's, that's what I've got in this slide. We're basically gonna literally take a Vianos Vila style term structure model and just do it in two currencies. Okay, and the way it's gonna work is what's gonna be exogenous, you can think of this as monetary policy, the path of the short rate in each of the two countries is gonna be exogenous. Okay, so what, we, what remains to be pinned down are the long rates, which will have to do with term premia and the exchange rate, okay? And what makes this sort of model, um, sort of a segmented markets model, you can think of there as being a group of what we might call global fixed income investors who absorb, they absorb the supply of bonds and currency in, in, in these two countries, but they're segmented away from, if you wanna think about consumption, other asset markets, the stock market, real estate, so they have limited risk tolerance. And so supply and demand shocks will matter. And because there are three assets or three prices, you can think of this as a little sort of intermediary capital asset pricing model where the covariances of these different risks with one another will be what matters, but will be basically again, segmented away from consumption and, and, uh, and you know, other, other asset markets. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I've said here. Let me give you the basic intuition here. You can think again, there are three assets or said a little differently, there are three trades that investors can do, okay? So one trade is the US uh, yield curve carry trade. You can borrow short and invest at the long end of the yield curve, right? And then uh, uh, symmetrically, there is a Euro yield curve carry trade. You can borrow short in Euros uh, and, and lend long in Euros. And finally, there is a currency carry trade which you can think of as borrowing in dollars short and investing in euros short, okay? And each of those trades has some risk and those risks are gonna to have to be priced in a, an integrated fashion, okay? So now the, the basic in, insight of this is that if you're an investor in the 
dollar yield per carry trade, the risks you face are somewhat similar to those that are faced by somebody who's doing the currency carry trade. What is the bad thing that can happen to you? Is the Fed raises rates, right? If the Fed raises rates, that's a bad thing for you if you're doing the term structure trade, right? For, for the obvious reason. It's also a bad thing for you if you're borrowing in dollars and, um, and you're borrowing in dollars and investing in euros, that trade gets hurt on impact when the Fed raises rates for the usual UIP reasons, okay? So those two assets or those two, two um, trades are exposed to the same risk. They're exposed to US short rate risk, okay? So in an integrated way, if the price of one changes, the price of the other is gonna to have to change, okay? So now let me walk you through kind of the logic. Suppose the supply of, we have a quantity shock. So the treasury issues a bunch more long-term US bonds, okay? Because we have limited risk tolerance, investors now are more exposed to US rate risk because there is a bigger supply of US duration, okay? So for the standard one country reasons, the price of the equilibrium price or the, the re excess return for bearing short rate risk has to go up that is to say, long-term rates have to go up in the US, okay? That's the term premium going up, okay? But now think about the person who's trading by borrowing in dollars and, and, uh, and investing in euros. That trade is also exposed to short rate risk, okay? Because there's more short rate risk, that trade also basically has to earn a higher return. How does that earn a higher return? Basically, the euro has to fall today so it can appreciate going forward, okay? So there's a shock, there's a sort of supply shock that has to increase the reward to bearing this risk. And that risk is borne both by US term structure traders and by carry traders, okay? So those, those risk premier are, are, uh, are jointly determined, okay? That's our basic, that's the sort of basic insight, okay? Um, so if, again, this, this is a little hard because it's, it's currencies and it's always a little bit confusing, but really it's just a three asset model where the assets have some covariances with one another. And so if you increase the supply, it's gonna have to affect the price of all three, of all three assets. That's the kind of slightly more general way to say it. All right. All right. So you know, the basic implications of this model are that quantity type things like QE will matter for exchange rates. I'll show you that it matters uh, differentially depending on the correlation of short and long rates. So for, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, excuse me, on the correlation of short rates across different countries. So basically if you have the US and Europe and they have relatively highly correlated short rates and the US and Japan have relatively less correlated short rates, when the US does something in Europe, you'll get most of the kick in, on the European bond market, but less on currencies. And in Japan, it'll be the other way around. So there's sort of some conservation principle that something is gonna either show up essentially in the term premium or in the FX risk premium, okay? So I can show you that. And then we have a bunch of extensions. And as I said, I'd like to spend a little time on this because this is where we go in a slightly different direction. One of the things um, that we explore has to do so so far everything is about violations of uncovered interest parity but i've said nothing about covered interest parity as people know in the last decade or so there have been fairly pronounced violations of cip and they've had an interesting relation to the level of the currency so basically the stylized fact is that when the dollar appreciates the cross currency basis becomes more negative which is a way of saying that synthetic dollar borrowing or hedging dollar positions becomes more expensive, okay? And a, a slight variant on our model kind of delivers something along those lines. So I'll try to do a little bit, um, a little bit of that as well. But let me start with just a little bit of evidence. Um, and let me be clear, none of, this, none of this is a test of the model, but this is, think of this as kind of broad motivation for why, why this is interesting. Um, so I wanna just sort of show you three stylized facts. One is that if you look at exchange rates, they seem to be out about as sensitive to long-term rate differentials as to short-term rate differentials. Okay? You know, if you were thinking about UIP, you might be particularly focused on short-term rate differentials, but long-term rates matter. I would like to convince you that the component of long rates that matters 
is not just expectations hypothesis, but term premium. And finally, that when the, when the exchange rate moves, it is it's itself a currency risk premium as opposed to just sort of a manifestation of UIP. And then finally, I wanna, I wanna sort of uh, suggest that the differences that, that are, these differences in term premia that matter for exchange rates are themselves quantity driven. That they you know, can basically be instrumented for with quantity shocks that's something you can't get in a complete markets model because in a complete markets model, sort of the government is a veil and quantities don't, don't matter. Okay, all right, so let me just show you a couple of quick regressions. Um, just to be clear here, the sign convention is that an increase in Q is an appreciation of the foreign currency relative to the domestic currency. So this is monthly data and I have three month changes. So what I'm showing you in the first column is that this is the, what you would expect with UIP when foreign short rate goes up relative to domestic short rates, the foreign currency appreciates. That's what you would expect in the most basic UIP set. What I'm showing you in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the second column here is if you add long rate differentials, they come in about as strong, okay? So when long rates in the uh, foreign country go up relative to domestic, that also appreciates, okay? This one is almost the same, except instead of using foreign long rates, I'm using very far forward uh, foreign rates. You can also use term premia extracted from the various models that try to extract term premia and basically, you know, say that when term premia, model extracted term premia go up, um, in the foreign versus the domestic country. Again, the foreign currency appreciates, okay? But to make it a little bit more pointedly about risk premia, now, instead of having the level of the currency on the left, I'm going to have the return on a carry trade. So this is now the return on the carry trade that borrows in dollars and invests in the foreign currency. So here I'm holding myself to a higher standard because I'm trying to forecast returns, I'm trying to forecast abnormal returns. And of course now the sign should be flipped. But again, you see that when long rates, when very far forward long rates go up, um, say in Europe relative to the US, because the Euro has appreciated on impact, it depreciates going forward, okay? So that's a way of trying to say that what I was showing you on the prior two slides can't just be explained by a kind of UIP logic, even with sort of very far forward expectations about changes in short rates. Okay, so this is, if you will, a trading strategy, a trading strategy where you're anticipating variation in currency risk premia based on movements in, in essentially long term rates. Okay, and then the final point I can show this to you graphically is essentially doing the same kind of thing but restricting ourselves only to days where either the US or other central banks have had big QE announcements, okay? So this is plotting on the horizontal axis, again, the foreign minus domestic move in long rates on the day or days around a QE announcement, and here is the movement in the currency. So it's basically just saying that the relationships that I showed you on the, on the, on the first two, two slides hold if you restrict attention or, you know, sort of very informally, if you instrument the moves in long rates with quantity shocks. So I want to say that all this stuff seems to be quantity mediated, which again puts you in the sort of in the land of segmented markets and risk premia and outside the world of, of complete markets. Okay, so again, none of this is intended, none of this is intended as a sharp test of the model, but just the kind of stuff you'd like to believe if you were gonna go down this, this modeling path. All right. So again, I'm just gonna sort of tell you what the assumptions are and then, and then, and then highlight um, some of the results. Uh, so again, as I said before, there are short-term bonds. You can think of this as essentially, you know, interest bearing central bank reserves and those pay uh, interest rates that are exogenously set by the central bank. Um, Okay, uh, both short and long. And then there are long-term bonds that are just priced basically to yield 
uh, to yield risk premia that equilibrate uh, supply and demand. Um, there's foreign exchange. You can you can essentially, uh, as I as I did, you can you can compute the return on a carry trade that borrows domestic and lends short term foreign, and it has to do obviously with the essentially change in the exchange rate and the relative interest rate uh, differentials. Okay, and the sort of things that make the model go is that we have again these specialized bond investors who are exposed to interest rate risk and less importantly for the intuition to supply risk. Okay, so there's, you know, there's supply shocks both in the domestic and foreign uh, bond markets and there can also be supply shocks to sort of the quantity of exchange rate risk that these guys have to bear. Uh, this is much like in a model uh, by Gebex and Maggiore. You can think of that as coming from trade or whatever. Okay, and then there are these exogenous short rate processes that we model as AR1s with some correlation between the domestic and the foreign um, interest rates. Okay, if you put all that in the model and just kind of work through, um, the first thing you get, again, is this sort of co-determination of term premium and, and exchange rate risk premium that I, that I said before, and I'll just, I'll just sort of rehearse it again. Suppose you get a shock that increases the supply of long-term treasury bonds, okay? What do we know has to happen? There is now more US rate risk to be borne. So the US term premium has to go up. That's just the Vianos Vila type of logic, okay? But now it's also gonna raise the Euro term premium because to the extent that the short rate processes are correlated, right? There's also more risk to be borne by European investors but since that correlation is less than one, you get a less than one for one effect. So if the term premium in the US went up by let's say 1%, maybe the term premium in Europe would go up by 25 basis points, okay? Now, what's gonna to happen to the third risk premium, which is to borrow dollars to lend euros, that also suffers when, um, when short rates in the US go up. So when there is more of that short rate risk to be borne, that, has, that trade has to offer a bigger risk premium. Again, that happens by the Euro depreciating so it can appreciate on a go forward basis. And that appreciate on a go forward basis is just what, we, what I was showing you in the empirical results about the carry trade returns, okay? So that's it. Supply shock in the US has to move both of these term premia, has to move the dollar term premium more, and it has to therefore appreciate the dollar and depreciate uh, the Euro. Okay, that's the basic result. Okay, um, the corollary, the sort of very obvious corollary of that is this whole thing will depend on the correlation of the two currencies. And so, as I said, if you think that Europe has a more correlated monetary policy to the US than does Japan, then when you get a shock in the US, that will move the European term premium by more and therefore the currency by less. In the extreme, obviously the extreme case, you take two currencies that have perfectly correlated monetary policies, they'll have perfectly correlated term premia, but they'll have no movement between the exchange rates, okay? At the other extreme, very uncorrelated monetary policy, not much correlation in the term premia, but therefore more action. And that's the sort of conservation intuition. You'll have to have more action in the, in the exchange rate, okay? Another little corollary here that comes kind of quickly is uh, uh, Lustig and co-authors have found that if you do the currency carry trade with long-term bonds rather than short-term, you don't earn as much. It's not as profitable, okay? That follows kind of immediately here because you can think of well, what's the long-term carry trade. It's borrow long in dollars and invest long in euros. That's like you can decompose that as the short-term carry trade plus a bond market trade, basically. It's a sort of borrow long in dollars and invest long in, in um, I'm gonna get it mixed up. It's, it's a, um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a borrowing long to let, borrowing long to lend short in domestic currency, excuse me, okay? It turns out if you just look at our model, these two have opposite, these two decomposed pieces have opposite exposures, okay? So this is like, in our, in our language, it's a hedged down version of the short-term carry trade, right? 
So if it's a hedge down version, it's going to offer less risk premium. That's basically all we're saying. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Let me try uh, to do a little bit about CIP violations. Okay, so in what I've shown you so far, there is no CIP. So CIP in the model so far, CIP would hold perfectly. Why? We have people that are, we have investors that are risk averse, but the CIP trade is itself completely riskless. It has no fundamental risk. So with nothing else in the model, CIP would hold. So to get there to be a CIP violation, of course, this is not special to us. This is, if you want any model with a CIP violation, you're gonna to have to introduce another friction. Okay, so we're gonna introduce one more friction. We're gonna get a CIP violation. You should be totally unimpressed by that because that's almost tautological and other people have done that. What is interesting is not just that we're gonna get a CIP violation, but as soon as we introduce the friction that gives it to you, we'll also get the correlation of the CIP basis with the outright level of the currency that we see in the data, okay? So what do we have to do, okay? We have to have basically an inability, an inability for the CIP basis to be perfectly arbitraged. So here's how we do it. And again, this is, I think, any, anybody who's gonna get this is gonna do some version of this. The investors that we've had so far in the model, okay? I'm gonna think of them, they can basically transact in forward contracts, but they can't do the CIP arbitrage. Why? Because basically I'm gonna say that essentially half of the investors are domestically based, they're based in the US, and half of them are based in Europe. They can have currency exposure, but they take it via forwards. And a European investor of the sort that we've been looking at before can't short physical dollars, okay? They can't basically borrow directly in the dollar market, okay? The only players who can borrow directly in the dollar market in both, in both things are banks, okay? So banks get basically can, you know, can borrow in dollars and can borrow in euros. They can do the CIP trade, but they're gonna face another constraint, which you can think of it as a balance sheet constraint. They can only do so much of this because they're subject to the leverage ratio. And if you've seen some prior work by Adrian Bertelhan and co-authors, this is basically the story they tell for why a CIP basis exists. Okay, so we're, we're basically adopting that story and then importing it into our setting and saying, well, what is that gonna do not only to the existence of a CIP basis, but to how it correlates with, the, with, with risk premium, okay? So again, we have the same setting as before, okay? Half the investors are domestic, half are foreign, but there is a limited ability to do the CIP arbitrage that can only be done by a new set of players that we're gonna call banks, okay? Jeremy, you have about uh, two, three minutes. Perfect, I think I can finish this and then I'll, I'll, I'll quit. Um, so now let's, let's, let's just, let's rehearse our same old thing again. Suppose there's again, an increase in the supply of dollars, of, I'm sorry, of, of treasury bonds, okay? Baseline model still holds, more short rate risk. So term premium in the US is gonna go up and the dollar is gonna appreciate, okay? That's just as before, okay? But now what's going on in the background? The dollar, I'm sorry, the, the term premium in the US has gone up relative to the term premium in Europe, okay? So now what would the US, what would the Euro bond investors like to do? They're like, ah, term premium is now higher in the US than it is in Europe. I would like to basically have more exposure to US term premium risk. I'd like to share that risk and earn some of the higher return, okay? So you have European investors basically who would like to come over and buy US treasury bonds so they can either earn that higher term premium. If there was frictionless hedging, they just want exposure to term premium. They don't necessarily want exposure to the other risk factor, which is currency. So in the frictionless version of the model, they would come over, they would buy US bonds and they would hedge out the currency piece with a short-term currency hedge, thereby just isolating the term premium piece, okay? In the, in the extended version of the model, they start trying to do that, but as they do that, to do that hedge, they have to transact with the banks. The banks essentially offer them that hedge by taking the other side, 
but the banks have to blow up their balance sheets to do that. And that starts sort of increasing the tightness of this constraint. So in the end, what do you get? You only go part way. They, the European investors will only partially hedge and the CIP basis becomes more negative, meaning it becomes more expensive to hedge the dollar position, okay? And depending on how binding essentially that, that leverage constraint is, you get some equilibration that involves both, okay? But so the important insight here is any, any kind of shock in this model that increases the term premium in the US and that therefore appreciates the dollar is gonna generate this demand for hedging, which will also increase the price of hedging. That is to say, which will drive the basis more negative. So that's the sort of overall, overall thing we get. Okay, so let me not try to rush through more stuff. We've done, we have some other things where we sort of further segment the market. So some people can only play dollars and some people can only play euros. That's a nice extension in the sense that it gives you kind of bigger quantitative kick and it also gives you more trading. And then you have what, what we didn't have in the baseline model, but we get when you segment a little bit more is you have trading and then it looks like exchange rates are flow determined in a very specific way, which is when there are flows that make those people who specialize in just holding currency risk bear more risk, that moves the exchange rate. So now we have something that's very much like a version of Gavex Maggiore, but where unlike them, in their model, the amount of risk borne by the FX dealers is exogenous. Here in this version of the model, it's endogenous to things like QE. QE kicks off flows that make the FX dealers hold more currency risk, and those flows in turn can be thought of as driving the exchange rate. But I won't, I won't try to do that. I will just stop. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeremy. And so now we have uh, Pierre Olivier Gurinches, and he will um, also talk about the uh, term structure and exchange rate risk. Yes, thank you, Oleg. And uh, I hope you can see me and you can see my slides. Um, so as, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, these two papers are close siblings. And uh, um, actually, some of the authors on each of the papers are also co-authors themselves. So there's an intellectual uh, uh, proximity here that, that is very obvious. The, the paper I'm, I'm going to present is with Dimitri uh, Vianos and, and, and Walker Ray. Um, and, and we're basically going after uh, the same question. We're doing it slightly differently, and, and we're trying to emphasize uh, slightly different aspects. And, and one of the things I'll try to emphasize is the quantitative relevance of uh, the type model that Jeremy presented and that we have as well in explaining uh, some of these features. But the, the broad idea is, is, very, is very similar. There, are, there is a lot of evidence that uh, risk premium on bond market and on currency markets are, are tied together or are connected. And once we start thinking about it this way, then there is an all avenue for thinking about transmission of shocks, whether it's quantitative easing or whether it's traditional monetary policy in one country and how it impacts the other country going beyond the impact it would have on the exchange rate uh, and having an impact on, on the term structure in the, in the foreign country as, in addition to the domestic country. So this is sort of the broad agenda that uh, we're interested in. And, and since Jeremy has done a very good introduction. That's going to save me a little bit of time in terms of my own presentation. And I will sort of, uh, what I will do is, is, is directly jump in and, and show you the way we model this, which is slightly different, but very related to what they're doing. Um, show you the analytical results we obtain in, in a number of cases that are easy to solve with, uh, with paper and pencil. If you want, and then show you the uh, more complex model uh, version of the model where we have to resort to, uh, to simulations. The basic message here, the basic findings, are one that uh, we can, with a framework like this one, with this uh, uh, segmentation uh, view of the bond and currency markets, we can reproduce uh, uh, both qualitatively but also quantitatively the facts about bond and currency risk premium that um, were presented earlier. Uh, we have a much richer menu of segmentation uh, of transmission of monetary policy shocks, uh, both under conventional monetary policy, but also un unconventional monetary policy via exchange rate and, and term premia and, and uh, their connection. 
And the general message which I, I like and I want to emphasize here is this idea that, um, you know, as you move to this more complex uh, uh, financial environment, you move away from the simple sort of uh, uh, Friedman, Upsfeld, Taylor trilemma, which basically says, look, you could just run your monetary policy at home and let your exchange rate float and your exchange rate is going to absorb anything that the foreign country might be doing in terms of its own monetary policy, whether it's uh, a conventional or, or unconventional. And, and you can just, you know, it can insulate you and, and you can just run your own monetary policy the way you want. And we're going to move away from this. We're going to have uh, limited insulation coming from the exchange rate. And, and that's something that uh, is, is sort of uh, an organizing theme for us in, in the way we're thinking about, about this paper. Now, there are a lot of things we leave out. What I'm going to present today is it's very much in the form of a sort of a, a partial equilibrium. We're looking at this financial market, the currency and the bond market in isolation. We're not plunging it back into the real side of the economy. We're also ignoring other asset markets, equity markets or other markets out there that are not part of the picture we're describing. And this is left for future work. It, it, and the modeling of that part is, is complex and, and we're, not, we're not there yet. All right, so let me, let me walk you through uh, the setup here. Uh, so we're gonna think about two countries. Uh, I'm gonna call them home and foreign. And we're gonna do things in continuous time. So time is gonna run from zero to uh, you know, infinity. And um, for future reference, I'm gonna call ET the nominal exchange rate between home and foreign. And the convention we're going to use is uh, the same one as, uh, as Jeremy, in Jeremy's paper, which is that when ET goes up, it's a depreciation of home's currency and therefore an appreciation of foreign's currency. So foreign currency become more expensive in terms of the domestic currency. Now, in each of this country, we're going to assume that we have a continuum of zero coupon bonds in uh, zero uh, net supply. And each of these zero coupon bonds are going to be uh, 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 a, with a maturity that's indexed by tau. So we have this entire universe of, of uh, zero coupon bonds of different maturities in the home and in the foreign country. And T, your cap T here, so the maximum maturity we're looking at, that could be, could be any number you want. Okay? And, and, and then we can define the price of a bond of maturity tau in uh, country J at time T. And the yield to maturity is also mechanically defined as the negative of the log of the price of that bond divided by the maturity of the bond. So this is just, uh, just notation. Now, think about the instantaneous uh, 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 bond, the one that pays sort of immediately. And so that's sort of like the, the, the rate on, on, on this, the yield on this is going to be the, the short rate. We're going to assume that that yield is controlled maybe by some central bank that adjusts the supply elastically to target a particular, a particular yield. And so we're going to take the, the nominal short rate. So you can think of this as a limit as you take the maturity to zero. We're going to take that as an exogenous process. And that's going to be one of the source of risk in our economy. So RJT here is going to be, think of this as the policy rate in country J. And we're going to assume that it varies over time according to some uh, a stochastic process with some innovations. These dBs here are, are these innovations to the, to the short rate process. And then some mean reverting uh, uh, so that this process is, is, is stationary. Okay, so we have in each country, we have the central bank sort of doing its things. We're not modeling why it's doing that. It might be an economy out there and it's responding to a bunch of things. We're not interested in that yet. We're just taking it as given that that short rate in the home and the foreign country is sort of moving around. And that's gonna be one source, one source of risk. And then we're going to think about three types of investors. Um, so one type of investors are going to be what we call uh, the preferred habitat bond investors. So these are guys that only buy bonds of a certain uh, country in a certain maturity. They are not doing any uh, cross-currency arbitrage. They are not uh, doing any arbitrage between different maturities uh, in, the, in the home or in the foreign country. They're just buying the bonds of some maturity tau and, and that's what they're doing, okay? So they're just present on that market. And, and this is where we have this, this uh, preferred habitat bond investors represent sort of, you know, investors with mandate that are out there. Maybe you have pension funds, you have life insurance companies, you have all kinds of investors that have a mandate that asks them to locate in that, in that yield curve on particular maturities. And so think of them as 
we have these populations in the home and foreign country. Then for the, we are going to assume that we have some currency traders. There are guys who just buy and sell domestic versus foreign currency at the short, uh, 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 at the short end. And so these guys, you can think of them as coming, maybe they're coming from the real side. Again, it could be exporters and importers. They need to get, obtain foreign currency in order to settle trade, uh, all kinds of reasons. We're not going to, we're not gonna get into what drives them. We're just gonna represent uh, their demand uh, uh, directly. And then on top of this, we're going to have this global rate arbitrage. And so this is, the, this is the sort of the special ingredient in the sauce, if you want. This is the thing that gets things going. And these are investors are going to be crawling around the domestic and the foreign yield curves and also in the currency markets. And they can take positions. And of course, they're going to try to spot arbitrage opportunities and try to take position to arbitrage them away. But they're going to be risk averse. So they're going to be limited in how much they can do. Uh, uh, and how much they can close this sort of arbitrage coming from this, this local demand shocks. Okay, so that's the, that's, the basic, that's the basic structure. Now, let me focus first on this global uh, uh, rate arbitrager and, and tell you what, uh, 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 what program that, that investor is solving. And so here, what I'm showing you is, uh, uh, what I'm showing you is the, the, the uh, optimization program that this uh, global rate arbitrage is doing, we're going to say, okay, well, this guy is, is sort of a, a mean variance guy. He's, mean, he's, he's trying to maximize the instantaneous return on his wealth minus a term that reflects the, the, the volatility of that wealth, WT. And the law of motion here is going to come from the return on the various investments. So it, you can think of this as all of his wealth is invested in the home currency. And then some of it it gets an excess return for the part that's invested in the foreign currency. So if you look at the term in parenthesis here, that's exactly your excess currency return. It's the short rate at, uh, in the foreign country minus the short rate in the home country plus the, the realized depreciation rate between T and T plus DT. Then there is a, a term that comes from his bond investment in the domestic, uh, in the domestic bond market. And so think of this XHT tau here. This is how much of the bonds of maturity tau issued by the home country uh, he is holding at the time and he earns an instantaneous return that's coming from the change in the price of these bonds relative to the relative to the short rate. And then there's something that is very similar in this for his investment in the foreign in the foreign uh, uh, in the foreign bond market where in addition uh, you, you can measure things relative to the foreign the foreign short rate. So this is a sort of a, just a description of the law of motion of that agent's wealth and the key insight here is that because this uh, uh, global rate arbitrager is risk averse, is going to be willing to adjust its positions, but it will have an equilibrium to be compensated for that by being offered uh, an expected return that reflects the, the riskiness of the portfolio or the additional uh, risk that he's taking on at the margin. Okay, so that's sort of the, the key insight here. I should have said something, I should have mentioned this uh, 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 before, but we're going to assume that that global rate arbitrager is sort of home-based so everything here, all of these quantities you have on the slide are measured in, in the home currency. That's one of the slight uh, assumptions we have to make to keep the model tractable, which is that we can't have really global rate arbitrages that would be located in home and foreign and value things differently. That would make things too complicated for us. So we're simplifying things, assuming that this is sort of a US global rate investor measuring things in dollars if you think that home is, is the US. Okay, now let's look at the uh, preferred habitat investors, and let me flesh out how they behave. They're going to behave very mechanically. So here we're going to assume that if you think about the demand for bonds and currency J of the given maturity tau, well, that's coming from this uh, preferred habitat bond investors. It's just going to be uh, uh, have two components. One component that is price elastic here. So that's this is saying, look, if the price of bonds of maturity tau is very very high, this this uh, preferred habitat bond investors are going to scale down how much they want to be holding. And this alpha J tau is telling you by how much they want to scale down. And then there might be some demand shock here, which is how we're going to think about maybe non-conventional monetary policy QE later on. You could think of this as sort of the central bank coming in as, and withdrawing some of, the, some of the bonds of that maturity from the market. It's like a shock uh, beta JT. Okay, so you have this habitat investors uh, located for all the Taos and, all, and, and both currencies, Js. And then in addition, we have this 
uh, 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 foreign currency investors, and they are they formulate a demand for currency that is also price elastic, where the price here is now the nominal exchange rate, and they could be also subject to some some shock here. So what the shock could be a bunch of things. One of the things we're going to be looking at is, for instance. You know, that could be a sterilized foreign exchange intervention by the central bank in one country that purchases foreign currency uh, relative to the home currency. One thing I should mention when you look at this equation here, it's slightly unusual if you think about it from the perspective of sort of a standard macro model. In a standard macro model, what you would have in place of this equation is something like a balance of payments equation. It's the balance of payments equation is like a flow equation, so it relates the, the trade surplus or the trade deficit to how you fund that. And here I'm writing a stock equation. I'm telling you, it's not the flow. It's the I'm writing directly the overall demand for uh, foreign currency by this uh, habitat investors. Now, of course, a stock is just accumulation of the flows, but you know it's a slightly uh, unusual way of representing this, and mostly because it gives us tractability. So we were departing a little bit from uh, the way things might be done. And this these shocks, these betas here, and this gamma, there are going to be sources of fluctuations in our model, um, we're going to be looking at what happens in terms of the transmission of shocks, et cetera, when we have some of these uh, betas and gammas being shocked around. Uh, now, I'm going to show, show that to you in the later part of the presentation when we have the full model. When we have this demand shocks, the model cannot be solved by hand. We have to resort to simulations in the computer, and we can uh, estimate the model, which we did. Um, but when we don't have the demand shocks, we can basically solve everything, uh, everything by hand. Now, the key inside of having this uh, preferred habitat investors, both on the bond and the currency market, is and the, 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 the important assumption here is, is that they're price elastic. And so the, the, when there's going to be a price movement, it's going to lead them to change their desired position. And in order for the market to clear, then the global rate arbitrage are going to have to come in and take the other side. But I told you that these guys only do that if they're compensated in equilibrium. So that's going to give you a link between sort of the change in the quantities that changes the price and requires a change in the expected returns going forward. All right. Now the markets are going to clear. Uh, so the uh, bond market at home is going to uh, sum to zero, foreign bonds as well, and the currency market. This is where the assumption that we're writing this in the stock version is coming in. Uh, the currency market, the overall demand for foreign currency is also going to net, net out to zero. One thing we do with the, our, our model, uh, in, in our model CIP holds, we're not doing like uh, Jeremy and, and, and co authors, we're not looking at CIP deviations. One in, direct implication of this is you can also introduce in the model demand for forwards um, uh, on the foreign exchange market. Most of the demand on the currency markets is not on the spot transactions, it's mostly on the swap and forwards. And you can do that very easily here because a forward or a swap is just a combination of you know, a bond trade in one currency, a bond trade in another currency and the spot transaction, as long as CIP is holding, it's just the same thing. So, so we, can, we can accumulate, you can, you can, we can introduce shocks to the demand for forward and it, it, it integrates very, very nicely as long as CIP is holding. Of course, CIP doesn't hold, then things are a little bit different. All right, so let's first start with sort of a benchmark, what I would call sort of the standard model that we have in mind when we think about these things. And that would be the case where the, the arbitrage is risk neutral. A here is the, uh, it's the coefficient that measures the degree of risk aversion of the, of, the, of the global rate arbitrage or risk appetite. And if you take that all the way down to zero, then that investor is going to be willing to take the other side of whatever the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, habitat investors want to do. And, and therefore, we're going to recover first the expectation hypothesis. So the expected return on bonds of any maturity is going to be the same thing as the short rate, there's not going to be any term premium, both at home and abroad. And therefore, what you recover from that immediately is that there's not going to be any effect of QE because any change in quantities is going to be absorbed by this global rate arbitrage or is not going to have any impact. So QE would have no effect in this world. And also, the yield curve is completely independent in the home country from the foreign country. I mean, the, the yield curve in the home country is going to be entirely determined by the shocks to the home policy rate and nothing that happens in the foreign country. And so that's this case of full insulation, if you want, absorbed by the exchange rate in the middle. And the exchange rate, if the global rate arbitrage is risk neutral, then the uncovered parity is going to hold. So the expected rate of depreciation is just going to be the difference in the short rates. And if those short rates have the same conditional mean, uh, uh, then you can actually solve for the 
the exchange rate and find an expression for the exchange rate that just depends on the short rates. And this kappa here is sort of the, the mean reversion coefficient on the short rate. So that, that's basically telling you the exchange rate is a function of the current and future expected short rates and the future expected short rates revert back to RT at, at, at speed kappa. So, so this is just uh, the, standard, the standard expression. Another observation we make here in, in the version of the model we have, uh, you see that the nominal exchange rate is, is stationary, which you might think is a little bit weird. We know the nominal exchange rate is not stationary. This is not really a big issue here. We can, we can reca recast everything in terms of the real exchange rate being stationary and then having some sort of price terms that make the nominal exchange rate non-stationary. Everything, everything goes through. So don't, don't think that you know, our model implies that the nominal exchange rate is stationary. That's, that's not the case. Okay, so now let's look at the cases that are more interesting. And I'm gonna do that step by step. I have about, I think about uh, um, six or seven minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna start with what I call this, uh, a, a case of, of segmented arbitrage. So think of this as a world in which you would have three different arbitragers. A home bond arbitrager is going to be arbitraging bonds of different maturities, but is not gonna engage in the foreign bond market. A foreign bond arbitrager is gonna do the same thing in the foreign country. And then a, a FX arbitrager is going to uh, basically engage in deviations from, from, uh, uh, from UIP, if you want. He's gonna, when he's going to spot deviations from UIP, he's going to engage in that. Okay. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because we can characterize very easily what happens there. And I'm, I'm also, I, I put this at the top here, I'm also ignoring the demand shocks for the time being. So the only source of risk here in this world is, is you have these fluctuations in the short rates that monetary authorities are doing for whatever reason, they're trying to do their job, but just as a result of that, the short rates are moving, okay? And then in that world, uh, things sort of uh, are very, very simple to characterize. First, you can show that the bond prices only depend on the interest rate in that country's currency. So the bond, the, uh, the price of a bond of maturity tau in currency J only depends on the short rate in currency J. It doesn't depend on the on the foreign on the foreign short rate it doesn't depend on foreign monetary policy. The exchange rate has it depends on both interest rates. So the the exchange rate still plays the role of sort of absorbing differences in between the two short rates. Um, now, if you focus first on this exchange rate part, you get back something that is similar to Gebeck's majority or uh, uh, these types of result, which is you're going to have a deviation from UIP now. Why do you have a deviation? Well, remember. If the uh, arbitrager is risk averse, he or she will want to be compensated for taking a position in foreign currency. So think about what happens when the foreign short rate increases. Then this guy says, oh, gee, I want to go and invest in my currency carry trade. I want to go short in the home currency and I want to go long in the foreign currency because it has a higher short rate at the initial given exchange rate. So that would lead the exchange rate, the foreign currency uh, to become more expensive, the exchange rate to go up, that will in turn lead the uh, habitat investors on the currency market to reduce their demand for foreign currency. As they reduce their demand for foreign currencies, it, the equilibrium in the foreign exchange market requires these investors, these arbitragers to step in, increase the holdings, and that requires that they are offered a, a currency carry trade return. So in other words, they have to be offered an expected return that is positive on holding the foreign currency now. So the exchange rate is going to appreciate, but not all the way to the UIP result. They will appreciate some of the way, and then there will be some, some sort of left, uh, uh, leftover uh, 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 excess return on the foreign currency. That logic also applies in the domestic bond market. And that's basically, that's a version of Vianos and Villa, and that's very similar to the other paper. If you think about what happens when, now imagine that the short rate in country J falls. So now it's in, it, from the point of view of the home bond investor, that guy wants to go short in the short rate and wants to invest in the bond of longer maturity. So he wants to invest in a bond carry trade. That's gonna drive up the price of the bonds at that maturity. Now doing that is going to reduce the holdings of the habitat investors. They're gonna to respond to that by scaling down how much they're holding. And so this bond arbitrager will have to increase holdings. And in order to be willing to do that in equilibrium, they will have to be offered a larger bond carry trade return. So the, the expectation hypothesis is not going to hold. And now there will be uh, an impact of the change in the short rate on, uh, uh, on the term structure and on term premium. Okay? And it's all going to happen through, through this term and, and risk premium. Now, the implications of the segmented model 
are a little bit more complex, but they are still giving us very little transmission from one country to another. It's still the case that if you have, for instance, something like QE here, it's going to be bottled up in the country where it happened. It's not going to do anything to the exchange rate. It might change the term structure in the domestic economy, but it won't do anything, anything uh, uh, to the exchange rate or anything to the foreign yield curve. Uh, if you have a sterilized dimension, that's going to move your exchange rate, but it's going to leave the bond markets uh, unaffected. And so the open economy macro implications, if you want, are that you still get full insulation. In the sense, I can still choose to control my term structure entirely through my domestic policy rate. And I don't have to worry about interferences coming from foreign monetary policy sort of playing with my, playing with my yield curve. It's going to be full insulation. Now, that full insulation is not because the exchange rate does the job. Here, it's coming because of the segmentation. We've assumed that somehow this arbitrage cannot take place. So of course, the segmentation uh, the insulation doesn't, doesn't appear. So let's move now to the full case, the global rate arbitrager, where you have one arbitrager who can sort of take positions in all of these markets at the same times, in all of the bonds. And here again, we can solve by sort of paper and uh, pencil. And what we get is now a characterization of the price of the bonds that as you can see from this uh, equation I, I, I put in the box there, includes the foreign short rate. So now the bond prices in country J depend on what happens to the uh, policy rate in country J prime. The exchange rate is still a function of both of these interest rates, but the coefficients here, it's a little bit of the conservation principle that Jeremy alluded to, the, 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 it's gonna become even less responsive than before. Now, the key insight here is now there's gonna be transmission both across markets and there's going to be a linkage between the bond and the currency risk premium. So let me walk you through uh, how we think about this. Think about what happens if you have a decline in the home policy rate. The short rate at home goes down. Now the global in, uh, rate arbitrager wants to do more currency carry trade, invest more in the foreign currency. And it also, also wants to do the bond carry trade, wants to invest in long-term bonds in the home country for the same reasons as before. Now that leads to a depreciation of the home currency and an increase in uh, the foreign uh, currency exposure. Now, the question from the point of view of the global rate investor, the question of how do I deal with this increased exposure to the foreign currency? This is what gives you uh, an impact on the foreign, on the foreign, uh, uh, the foreign term structure. Is the best way to hedge that increased FX exposure is going to be to invest in the long-term foreign bonds. Why? Well, because their price is going to increase when the foreign short rate is dropping, which is what's going to put you at your exposure at risk. So now that global rate arbitrager wants to take a longer position in the bond in the foreign currency. That again leads to an increase in the price in these bonds and uh, leads to a, a required increase in uh, adjustment in the, in, the, in the bond carry trade in the foreign country. Yeah, Olivier, you have a, about two minutes. Okay, thank you. Macro implications are now much more complex. Now what we're going to have is if you have QE in one country, that's going to not only affect the yields in a home country, but it's going to transmit and reduce uh, the yields in the other country and depreciate the currency. So that's very similar. And of course, we have exactly the same economic logic as in the previous paper that Jeremy presented. If we think about unexpected sterilization here, so suppose that the home central bank decides to purchase foreign currency and does this by, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore uh, increase the demand for foreign currency, that's also going to affect both the exchange rate, but it will also affect the term structure, both in home, uh, in the home country where it's gonna reduce bond deals at home and it's gonna increase bond deals in the foreign country. So ex foreign exchange or reserve interventions are gonna have much more complex effects in, in this world. And so we have uh, imperfect insulation coming from the exchange rate now, we have this uh, complex speed overs, and we have a failure of the classical trilemma. I have about one minute left, so I'm going to sort of show you a few of the results we can get in the full model. So what is the full model? The full model introduces five sources of variation. The two short rates, like I described up, up until now, and then three demand factors, one on the home bonds, one on the foreign bonds, and one specifically on the currency market that is gamma. So we specify a process for all these shocks, then we put this into the model. And then what we say is we say, okay, well, let's try to match a bunch of moments in order to recover the parameters of the model. 
So here, what I'm showing you is the sort of the targeted uh, moments that we try to we try to replicate. So we look at things like the variability of the change in the yields. This is the maturity that you have on the horizontal axis uh, in the home country, or the uh, standard deviation of the foreign uh, the foreign yields, um, the change in the foreign yields, or the correlation between the yields and the short rates. Uh, or we can look also at, so we look at a bunch of correlations uh, as a function of maturity. I'm showing you the data for the US and the UK, and I'm showing you in red, um, the, uh, um, uh, the data is in red and the model is in blue. So we replicate pretty well the pattern of co-movements uh, between yields uh, in, both, uh, in both markets. And then we say, okay, well, let's do a monetary experiment. Let's run a monetary policy shock and let's do a QE shock. So the monetary policy shock is what I'm showing you here. Here you see the, res the response of the yield curve in, a, in the home country to a, a monetary policy uh, a shock in the home country. And so what you see there is that the yield curve, so the, 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 the yield curve, the, the rates at the, the short end of the maturity curve drop down a lot. There is very limited transmission to the foreign country. So here you see that the foreign country, you don't find much. There's a big response of the exchange rate. The currency depreciates here. This is a monetary easing at home. You get a big depreciation of the exchange rate. I would say it's not very, very different from what we have in a standard model. If you were sort of thinking that you would can get a very different response of the yield curve in a foreign country, we don't see it much here. Where we do see it is when we look at the response to QE. So this graph here is showing you the yield curve response to a QE shock that is calibrated to be of the same size as a monetary policy shock. So something like the 25 basis point decline in the, in the short rate. And you see a big response of the yield curve at home. But what is interesting to us is you see a response of the yield curve in the foreign country, in, in the UK in that case, that is pretty much of the same order of magnitude. So enormous transmission to the foreign yield curve in the estimated model. Uh, to the foreign, to the uh, uh, in response to a QE shock, uh, the exchange rate also responds much more strongly. If you look, compare the magnitude uh, uh, to a standard monetary policy shock, policy shock. Remember, you're calibrated to 25 basis points uh, in both cases, so the size of the shock, if you want, is about the same. And the exchange rate is much more responsive. And why is that? Uh, why is the exchange rate more responsive? Well, because there is this big adjustment in the term premium, uh, as as I described earlier, and as as Jeremy described as well. Okay, so we have a bunch of other things that we can explain, but I'm out of time. So we have an integrated framework to understand uh, this various phenomena. We think that this is a realistic framework. We think that it's also quantitatively relevant and can get us uh, a, a, a better understanding of uh, how monetary policy shocks, conventional and non-conventional, transmit across countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... And so the final paper, uh, Dima will present uh, uh, the uh, uh, Musa puzzle redux. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think Pierre Livria needs to stop sharing his slides so that I could start sharing mine. Okay. Can you see the slides? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So this is the joint project with Oleg, and it is actually very closely related to the two papers we, that we have just seen, uh, even though the motivation is slightly different. So for us, the motivation comes not from the QE, but rather from another policy experiment from the Musa puzzle. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me start by uh, reminding you what the Musa puzzle is about. So in short, this is the uh, the empirical fact about the dramatic change in the behavior of exchange rates associated with the end of the Bretton Woods system. Right? And it, it can be seen from these two pictures. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have changes in the normal exchange rate of the US against seven other, other countries. And you can see that up until the end of the Bretton Woods, the exchange rate was pretty stable. Right? So except a few large depreciations and appreciations, the exchange didn't move much. And then starting from 1973, we see that the exchange rates uh, become very volatile. So these are annualized changes and the standard deviation is about 12 percentage points per annum. So this fact uh, per se is not really surprising, right? This is just manifestation of the fact that the exchange rates were packed under the Bretton Woods and then were allowed to float. What is surprising, however, is that the dynamics of the real exchange rate 
is also very similar, right? So what is the real exchange rate? This is just the ratio of the price indices in one country relative to the other country once they express in the same currency. So this is the relative price. It is a real variable. And yet its dynamic is very similar to the, to the behavior of the normal exchange rate. We see that the real exchange rate was pretty stable up until 1973. And then it starts moving almost one to one with the normal exchange rate. And so it has the same uh, high volatility. So why is this fact interesting? Well, one of the reasons is because it is considered as a prime evidence of monetary non-neutrality. We know that it is very hard to come up with any exogenous variation in the monetary policy. And yet this episode provides something like a regression discontinuity design. We, we see a switch from pack to the float and we see that the properties of the real variables, the real exchange rate changes overnight, almost immediately, right? And uh, so that's, that's that's the interesting fact. And then the question, the next question is naturally what explains this monetary non-neutrality, right? So, so why is it that uh, monetary policy affects real variables? And one simple explanation is that it is all due to nominal rigidities, right? So once we look at the uh, definition of the real exchange rates, so one way to, to, to make real exchange rate follow closely nominal exchange rate is to make inflation adjust sluggishly. Right? So, so if prices are sticky, if uh, inflation adjusts only sluggishly, then both under floating regime and under the peg, the real exchange rate will follow closely the normal exchange rate. And so somehow the, the, in the previous literature it has become as the most uh, conventional way of explaining the Mosa puzzle. So this is where we want to push a little bit back. We want to argue that actually, once you look at the broader set of moments, it is not uh, sufficient to have sticky prices to, to explain the Mosa puzzle. So in the end, we argue that sticky prices are neither necessary nor sufficient. And instead, we, we think of the Musa puzzle, this Musa effects, as the prime evidence of monetary policy transmission through the financial markets, through its effects on the risk premium shock. So we will, we, I will present a model which is very similar to the one that we saw uh, in the previous two papers, but which, which talks to this empirical fact. So before going into details, let me briefly summarize the, the, the key argument of the paper. So this is the same picture that I showed you on the previous slide. This is just dynamics of the real exchange rate under two exchange rate regimes. And if this were the only pieces of evidence that we had, then it seems very natural to reject the conventional flexible price model, right? We see that a change in the monetary policy it changes the properties of the real variable. And to explain this pattern, we, we need some form of nominal rigidities. So what is missing from these pictures is the behavior of other macro variables. And I, I'm going to show you more evidence later on, but let's focus on real consumption for now. So it turns out that there, once we look at the, re, at the real consumption and put it on the same scale as the real exchange rate, there is no really evidence of structural break in 1973, right? So quantitatively in terms of the order of magnitudes, there's no such discontinuous change in the behavior of uh, real consumption as we see for the real exchange rate. So in other words, there's, there is some form of monetary non-neutrality, but it is very peculiar form of monetary non-neutrality. So the, the change in the monetary policy affects uh, dramatically the behavior of the real exchange rate, but it doesn't affect the properties of other macro variables. And this is of course a challenge for the sticky price model, right? So if we think of conventional sticky price model, once we change the Taylor rule, once we change the monetary policy, that will affect all macro variables. And, and so, so uh, it, it's hard to rationalize all these four pictures together. So the first contribution of our paper is to show that, uh, to formalize this idea and to show that no matter whether we have a model with sticky prices or flexible prices, we can't really match all these four pictures simultaneously. So how can we do that? So what model can explain all these moments simultaneously? Well, the natural starting point for us is the last two pictures, the dynamics of macro variables and exchange rates under floating regime, right? So this is what we focused on in our previous work uh, on the exchange rate disconnect. So in that paper, we argued that to have a model in which we have such large volatility in the real exchange rate and yet uh, a realistic small volatility in other macro variables, we need a financial shock. Right, so the shock which shows up as a wedge in the UIP condition. So this, this financial shock, it is the key driver, driver of exchange rates and yet it has relatively small effects on other macro variables. So the Musa puzzle is, turns out to be more challenging, right? So it kind of doubles the set of moments that we're after. Now we have all the same moments under the floating regime, but also we have uh, new moments under the back. And so what we learn from this ex experiment effectively is that 
the monetary policy, once it switches to the PEG, it, it dampens uh, these financial shocks, right? So what we want is a model with endogenous financial shocks, with endogenous UIP deviations, uh, which uh, go down once the monetary policy starts stabilizing nominal exchange rate. And so in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to show you such model. Okay, so let me jump directly to the empirical patterns to show you empirical evidence. Uh, so we, we use, uh, we, we focus on the US against seven other, other countries. We annualize all macro variables to make them, them comparable. And we use 1973 as the uh, uh, year of structural break. So th this slide shows the key empirical findings. So we, we, we calculate the standard deviations for, for the real exchange rate, relative inflation, consumption, production index, GDP, and net exports. And, and uh, the red dashed line shows the averages before 1973 and after 1973. We also compute the standard deviations using moving averages. So we start from 1973, we take five years before, before that moment, we compute the standard deviation, and then we, we move backwards from 1973 and we separately move forward, right? So this procedure kind of biased towards finding a structural break in 1973. And so, as you can see from these pictures, uh, there is a significant change in the volatility of the real exchange rate, right? So it, the, for the most of the Bretton Woods period, the volatility was about two percentage points per annum. Then because of uh, some depreciations and appreciations, it went up to four percentage points uh, in the early 70s. And then uh, from 1973 onward, it jumps up to about 12 percentage points. So once we cal calculate the standard deviations for other macro variables and put them on the same scale, there is nothing comparable to this jump, right? So there's no evidence of large structural break associated with the end of the Bretton Woods. So, so after establishing this, we can zoom in, we can look separately at each of these macro variables. So this is the same picture, but using different scales for different variables. And even after we zoom in, it turns out there is not much evidence of structural break, right? So for example, for production in index, for GDP, this looks almost like a perfectly smooth uh, line. So the only exception is inflation, which is presumably due to oil shocks in 1970s, but you can see that th this jump in the volatility is, is not as large as uh, for exchange rates, and it is also short-lived. So after a couple of years, the volatility of inflation goes down. So the average inflation before 73 and after 73 is almost, is almost the same. So we can do this separately for each individual economy. We can compute the standard deviation under the peg and under the float. We can take the ratio of the two and construct the confidence intervals. And so, so again, we find that for each individual economy in our sample, there is significant and large change in the volatility of the exchange rates, while the ratios for all other macro variables across all countries, they're close to one. They are not statistically significant uh, from, from one in most cases. Okay, so, so, the, so this is kind of the, the base. So these are the uh, basic facts that we want to rationalize, that we want to understand. And the first question is whether other, our conventional standard models uh, with sticky prices or flexible prices can simultaneously match all these pictures, all these moments. So what we do to answer this question, we, we, we focus on a fairly general model. So we will impose the minimum um, restrictions on the asset markets and the goods markets. Then we will define a class of conventional models and we will derive some predictions of this model and test them in the data. So here's our benchmark model. So we start with two country open economy model. Uh, as usual, households maximize expected utility from consumption and leisure subject to the budget constraints. So they collect labor income, uh, profits, transfers from the government, the, they spend this income on consumption and they make investment decisions. And so, as I said, at this point, we want to be fairly general. So we allow in each PDT, uh, we allow households to trade assets uh, JT. So theta JT is the price of asset J and BJ is the, is the size of the positions that households take in this asset. So in the next period, uh, households collect uh, dividends, they collect income on these assets, DJ. A and the first shock that we introduce in this model is this zeta JT. So this is the country specific shock to the returns of asset J, right? So, so the, the most straightforward way to interpret this shock would be to assume some exogenous capital controls or some markups uh, charged by uh, financial intermediaries. Uh, 
So we don't really take a stand where these shocks are coming from. So why do we have them? Well, from our previous work, we know that without these financial shocks, it is impossible to match um, moments even under the one floating regime, right? So to give the model the highest chances to match the, the data we allow for this financial shock, and then we're going to check whether the model can explain the moments both under floating regime and also under the pack. So consumption in each country is the, is the combination of domestically produced goods and uh, imported goods. So one minus gamma is the home bias and gamma is the openness of the economy. And, and, the, and the, the second shock that we allow in this model is this uh, Xi T, which is the preference shock for, for domestic versus imported goods. Finally, production side of the economy is summarized by the linear technology uh, and, and AT is the productivity shock in this model. So it turns out that the equilibrium in this model can be summarized with three conditions. So the first one characterizes equilibrium in the international financial markets. So it is the international risk sharing condition. So if asset markets were complete, then we would get the standard Baku Smith condition. In other words, the relative consumption in each country in, in the country will be would be proportional to the real exchange rate. More generally, once we have incomplete asset markets, this condition holds only on average, right? There's a, a there's an expectation operator. And in addition, there will be a wedge in the risk sharing condition. And this uh, this wedge, Psi T hat, uh, has two sources. So one of them is exogenous. Uh, as I said, right, we allow for this uh, capital control shock, this uh, zeta uh, tilde, which is completely exogenous in the model. And the second component is endogenous. This is the risk premium. So, so the, uh, if we take the original risk sharing condition, we lock linearize it. And so we have not only the first order term, but also higher order terms. And so they are all uh, combined into this risk premium term. The second equilibrium condition is the country's budget constraint, which just says that the discounted sum of future trade balances has to be equal zero. And the third equilibrium condition is the goods comes from the goods markets. So this is some form of New Keynes and Phillips curve, and it depends in general on the details of the model. So it depends whether we have sticky wages, whether we have sticky prices, whether the price are sticking the local currency or producer currency. Uh, so, so that's why it's, it's hard to, to write down one particular form of, of this equilibrium condition, but it turns out that for our results, it doesn't really matter. So we can allow for arbitrary, uh, arbitrary price stickiness uh, or wage stickiness in our model. Okay, so as I said, this is a fairly general model, right? We, we imposed on the minimum restrictions on the asset markets, on the goods markets. So now I'm going to impose additional restrictions. I'm going to define the, the class of models that we call conventional. In particular, we call conventional models the ones in which the monetary policy affects real outcomes only for the goods markets, not for the financial markets. Right, so more precisely, we, are, we consider the class of models in, this, in which this uh, financial wedge, this uh, Psi T hat is completely exogenous to the monetary policy. Okay? So let's think for a second which models uh, satisfy this criteria. So if we take the standard international RBC model, or we take a conventional open economy sticky price model, and locally linearize equilibrium conditions in these models, then, then we will get a conventional model. Right? So in, the, in this uh, log linearized models, the risk premium is just equal zero. We neglect higher order terms. And the only source of uh, deviations from the, from the risk sharing condition are exogenous coming from this uh, zeta shock. Right? So in, in this standard log linearized models, the only way the monetary policy affects real outcomes uh, is, is really working for the goods markets. Alternatively, we can solve non-linearly the full uh, fully non-linearly, this uh, international sticky price or flexible price model. So in this case, of course, the risk premium will be endogenous, right? It will depend on the monetary policy. It is a function of consumption prices. And so it will depend on the monetary policy. However, we know that quantitatively, this risk premium is very small. We know that because there's an equity premium puzzle. We know that this models result in a small uh, risk premium. And as a result, quantitatively, these models behave still very closely to, to the to the conventional models that we define here. Okay. So, so now, can these conventional models reproduce uh, the Musa puzzle? So it turns out that once we focus on the cole Opsfeld case with isoelastic preferences, all these conventional models re result in a, uh, equilibrium relationship in a particular sufficient statistic, which is independent of the monetary policy regime. So in other words, independently from the values of other parameters, the relative consumption minus the real exchange rate 
should behave exactly the same way under the back as under the float. Right, so, so why is it a very useful result for us? Because it can be directly measured in the data. This Z, ZT can be directly measured in the data and we can estimate the volatility of this object under the floating regime and under the back and, and test whether, it's, whether it, it, it remains the same across two regimes, right? So importantly, as I said, it doesn't really depend on the price thickness. So intuitively, if prices are flexible, then we know that the monetary policy will affect neither uh, neither exchange real exchange rate nor relative consumption. On the other hand, if prices are sticky, then the, the behavior of the real exchange rate will depend on the monetary policy, but this is also true for relative consumption, right? So it is really the combination of the two which is invariant to the monetary policy and other details of the model. So that's kind of the power of this proposition. And so, as I said, we can directly test it in the data and unsurprisingly, it turns out that, that this, this is not true in the data, right? We already talked that, uh, about this. We said that uh, relative consumption is pretty stable across two regimes, while the volatility of real exchange rate goes up significantly. And so uh, this combination, this ZT, uh, its volatility changes uh, quite significantly after 1973. So this is true. Uh, for the US against the rest of the world, but it is also true for each individual economy in our sector. So not only uh, does this, uh, this proposition allow us to test this, this models, this conventional models, but it also shows us in which direction we need to go to explain uh, the date, right? It shows that we need a model in which the risk premium is endogenous to monetary policy and in which uh, it changes in a particular way uh, in the, once the monetary policy switches from floating to the back. Okay. So this is exactly what we're going to do next. We outline such model and to focus on the uh, on the risk premium, to focus on the financial friction, we assume that the prices are completely flexible. So there are no nominal rigidities whatsoever in this setup. So in particular, we focus on the model with segmented uh, asset markets. We assume that local households can only trade uh, domestic bonds, which are denominated in local currency. So uh, home households can trade bonds denominated in home currency and foreign households trade nominal bonds denominated in foreign currency, and there are arbitrageurs which intermediate funds across the economies. In addition, there are also noise, noise, noise traders which inelastically supply and demand to currency. So you can see this is very similar to the setup from Gabay and Maggiore, it's except that just like in the previous two papers, was, the limits to arbitrage come from the risk aversion of the arbitrageurs, not from the uh, financial constraints or borrowing constraints. Okay, so another key difference actually from the papers that we have just seen is that to, to because we want to focus on the effects of monetary policy, we assume we, we assume a CARA utility, right? So instead of focusing on the mean variance preferences, we start from the CARA preferences where arbitrageurs maximize real consumption, real utility from real consumption, right? So in other words, we compute uh, returns from carry trade. They, in one currency, they invest in the other currency. So this R tilde shows the nominal returns. And then we divide this, divide this R tilde by the price index, the price of the consumption bundle. So, so there is really no built-in monetary non-neutrality. The, the arbitrageurs are maximizing real returns rather than nominal returns in this setup. So once we solve this problem, we get the standard results so that the, the portfolio choice, the portfolio that this arbitrageurs uh, hold is proportionate to the uh, relative returns of the two assets. Just as usual, the, uh, the arbitrageurs are borrowing in the cheap currency, they invest in the currency with the higher expected returns. And, and crucially, the absolute size of these positions depend inversely on the volatility of the normal exchange rate. Right? So again, even though the arbitrageurs, uh, even though arbitrageurs care about real returns, what matters for their portfolio decisions is not the volatility of the real exchange rate, but rather the volatility of the normal exchange rate. And intuitively, if, we, if there are two bonds, let's say in euros and the dollars, once the nominal exchange rate is fixed, these two bonds become is completely isomorphic from the point of view of arbitrageurs, right? So they're willing to uh, take arbitrary large positions in these two bonds uh, to do arbitrary large carry trade to eliminate any, um, any arbitrage in the market. So what we do next, we, uh, from, the, from this partial equilibrium, we go to the general equilibrium. So we substitute in the interest rates uh, from household order equations, and we impose the market clearing in the asset markets. We impose the condition that the uh, uh, demand of arbitrage should be equal to the supply of households and noise traders. And so what we get is the following uh, 
uh, equilibrium condition. So the first one is again the international risk sharing. So it looks almost the same in our baseline model, except that this coefficients, this pass through of uh, let's say noise trader shocks into uh, risk premium depends on the monetary policy, right? So this Xi1 and Xi2, they, they depend on the volatility of the normal exchange rate, and this will be the key source of monetary non-neutrality. Uh, the other two conditions are exactly the same as before. We still have the country's budget constraint. We still have uh, goods market clearing, which is very simple uh, since the prices are flexible. So you can see that the only place in which monetary policy enters this equilibrium system is the first equation, uh, is through the volatility of the normal exchange rate. And so the key result here is that our key positive result is that a switch from PEC to the float can generate an arbitrary large change in the volatility of nominal and real exchange rates. And at the same time, it, it generates vanishingly small volatility in other macro variables, as long as economies are relatively close. Okay, so let me go through this result. So let's start minutes. with the floating. Two minutes. Yes. Let me start with the, with the floating regime. So under the floating regime, the exchange, the normal exchange rate is moving. So it's pretty risky for arbitrageurs to do carry trade. And so they will charge a risk premium, right? So once noise traders want dollars, the dollar exchange rate needs to appreciate on impact to generate expected depreciation and compensate arbitrageurs for taking these positions. And moreover, for the model to be, to, to be consistent with the disconnect, we need this, these noise trader shocks to be the key drivers of the exchange rate under the flow division. Suppose now that the monetary policy switches to the fixed exchange rate. So what happens? The volatility of the normal exchange rate goes down to zero, which means that the pass-through of, of these financial shocks will, will go to zero as well, right? So now arbitrageurs are happy to take any positions. They are happy to fully offset uh, any demand coming from noise traders. And so that eliminates the key driver of the exchange rate, of the real exchange rate. Moreover, that will also eliminate, the, it will still result in a small change in the volatility of other macro variables. And there are two reasons for that, for that. So the first one is almost trivial. This is the partial equilibrium logic. So the, as long as the model, as long as the economies are relatively close, the pass through of the exchange rate into real outcomes, into aggregate consumption and aggregate output will be very limited, right? And so when we say economies are relatively close, of course, it means both uh, the share of tradables, but it also takes into account the uh, pricing to market, the distribution margins and many other uh, sources of, of low pass through. But more important for, for our setting is, is the general equilibrium channel, right? So even if the, if the economy was, were completely closed, a change in the Taylor rule, a change in the monetary policy would still affect all macro variables. So why, why is it the case that in, in this model, there's very small effect on other macro variables? The, the reason is that once monetary policy commits to stabilizing normal exchange rate, it eliminates the main source of the volatility of the normal exchange rate, right? By making this psi one equal zero, it eliminates this financial shock. And so in equilibrium, the monetary policy doesn't need to respond to these shocks at all, right? So it still needs to respond to other fundamental shocks, but to stabilize a real ex normal exchange rate, it doesn't need to respond to this uh, noise trader shocks. Uh, and, and so that allows the model to generate relatively small changes in other macro variables. So let me just mention quickly that, so in addition to, to explaining the scheme, most effects, the model is also consistent with other over ideal moments. So it, is, it can uh, explain the um, changes in the forward premium puzzle across two regimes, the, the differences in the Baku Smith puzzle and Balassus Moyesian effect across back and the float. And uh, we also look at the, at the uh, alternative mechanism. We show that uh, there is little empirical evidence uh, for the alternative mechanism, such as implementing back using foreign exchange rate interventions and capital controls. OK, so I guess I don't have time to, to show the quantitative results. Let me just uh, wrap up by saying that the Musa puzzle is the, is the primary evidence of monetary non neutrality. Uh, at the same time, it is a very weak test of nominal rigidity. So we show that uh, sticky prices are neither necessary and nor sufficient to explain uh, the empirical facts. And instead, we think that it is an, an important piece of evidence of the transmission of monetary shocks for the financial markets. So it has important implications for the debate about float versus PEC, but it, is also, uh, it also has important implications for closed economy macroeconomics for the monetary economics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dima. So we have only about uh, five, six minutes left. Uh, uh, if somebody has questions, raise your hands while you do that. I had a quick question for um, 
uh, Jeremy and Pierre Olivier. So uh, while I was thinking, I was trying to kind of map the mechanism that you have in a macro model with the goods market. And so I was kind of curious how the economy openness would factor in. So in the limited case, when economies almost don't trade goods with each other, all of the adjustment can be done by exchange rate movements. That um, interest rate movement in one country will not spill over to interest rate movements in the other country. Everything will be undone by exchange rate movements and it doesn't spill over into the goods market. But is it true that when economies are increasingly more open in, in the goods market, there is less room for exchange rate to move and do the adjustment. And so you would expect interest rate movements in one country to spill over more and more into interest rate movements in the other country. So that like kind of testable implication is that if countries trade little, more of the equilibrium adjustment happens through exchange rates. If countries trade more, more and more adjustment must happen through the pass through of interest rates from one country into interest rates in the other country. That's kind of the implication in our model with DEMA. And I was kind of curious whether it's like a robust feature uh, across models as well. I, I suspect you're right. I mean, my intuition is pretty limited. I think we were doing it exactly in, or thinking about it in exactly the limit case that you described where there's sort of no goods market integration. And so I suspect that you're right as you add that, there has to be this extra margin, but I'm, I'm out of my depth here. Maybe Pierre Olivia has a... Yeah, I, I, I think, I think you're right, but I would want to think about the demand, the currency demand is not just ori originating in the goods market. And, and I think, you know, you could, you could think of it as originating from uh, any kind of speculative position in, in currencies also not driven by, not driven by trade. And, and so that gets us to, you know, if, you, if I think about what the BIS reports in terms of, uh, you know, uh, volume of transactions on the foreign exchange markets. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of that is not related to trade and the, the sort of the, and so the set, settlement of, of, of uh, goods market transactions and the share it represents of the overall volume of transactions in the foreign exchange market. I think that's, that's a tiny fraction. So you could think of this as, okay, well, we're already in a pretty integrated world, but what drives the demand for currencies goes beyond that. And that's sort of the view that we have. But if we were sort of scale that down, I, I think you were right, although I'm a little bit hesitant to, to say it for sure, because we haven't, we haven't looked at that, um, at that margin directly. Yeah, I was thinking it could suggest like an empirical test if you have countries that are more integrated versus less integrated. Um, one of the tests of the mechanisms could be um, uh, whether, you know, but, but obviously the, you have to identify the shock for uh, interest rate movement that kind of originates purely in the financial market, like a shift in demand for some type of bond or something like that. I mean, one way it might possibly show up, I don't think this is the whole thing, but we have this sort of exogenous correlation between their monetary policy. And I suppose if the goods markets are more integrated, that will do something to shape the correlation of the monetary policies, although it may not be the only determinant. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be uh, shut down in uh, a minute or two. Uh, let, let, me, let me ask a question to, to Dima and you. I, I mean, I like very much your paper and it has this, you know, you have this source of shock in the foreign exchange market and you sort of, if you peg the exchange rate somehow, you sort of, it disappears. There's sort of like a, a, a freebie there. Would you, would you, in the version of your model where you have the bond market in the long term, would you have something similar there? I mean, could there be some source of volatility that would have been maybe there in fixed exchange rate and flexible exchange rate, or precisely because you have some connection between this risk premium, would you expect it to change across the exchange rate regime? I mean, that, I, that, I was trying to process through, you know, our model through your empirical results. And I was, I was trying to sort of think whether you've thought about that. Well, I, I think the quick answer, we, we took the very limited case of the model where bonds become perfect substitutes when there is no exchange rate risk. And so that model works for the macro facts. But I guess the true world is that the bonds are still not perfect substitutes, even in that limit. And it would require more, like, it would just require a more complex model. In our model, they become perfect substitutes. And under the peg, uh, really, um, the UIP and CIP hold perfectly, which is probably not true in the real world, right? So, and so that holds for uh, all maturities, right? So for each maturity, they become perfect substitutes. Uh, 
Right. The question is whether in, in real world we have any evidence on what happens to the volatility of term premia at home versus foreign in flexible versus fixed exchange rate, whether there is some sort of Musa fact that you've looked at. Yeah. yeah. So this is an extra set of moments we didn't look at. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think we will be off. I want to thank you very much for participating. I was, it was very exciting for me, so hopefully you enjoyed it as well. And Mol, I had a question for you. I'll send you an email. Thank you, Oleg. It was great. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, good seeing everyone. Bye. Bye.